Wiseman. Uh, she's a senior astrophysicist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in the Greenbelt, Maryland, where she serves as a senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope. Her scientific expertise is centered on the study of star forming regions in our galaxy using a variety of tools, including radio, optical, and infrared telescopes. Her talk this evening, the Hubble Space Telescope, 28 years of unveiling the cosmos. Please uh, help me welcome Dr. Wiseman. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for welcoming me here. This is uh, really fun. I used to live, I now live in Maryland, but I used to live in Charlottesville. So I, you know, this making this drive kind of between Baltimore area and Charlottesville has reminded me of, of my life down here in Northern Virginia and it's beautiful. So I'm glad to be down here. I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing and have done and will do with the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble has been orbiting the Earth for 28 years now. Can you believe that? So um, we celebrated Hubble's 28th birthday this past spring. Hubble is what we call a general purpose observatory. So we use it for all kinds of as astronomy. Uh, astronomers around the world use it. They compete for time. They write proposals that get evaluated and by uh, professional peer review panels and then uh, the best ones are selected and then the uh, people at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center where I work uh, along with people at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore work together to get those programs scheduled and keep the observatory working well. Um, if you want to know more specifically what we are doing with Hubble and find images, find history, find all kinds of information, we have a wonderful website, nasa.gov slash Hubble. And in fact, if you go to that site, it, uh, we're, I think we're the only telescope that tweets, all right? So Hubble will tell you what it's looking at at any particular moment. It says, I'm looking at this or I'm looking at that. Um, and then we're all over social media at NASA Hubble on all the various social media sites. So uh, we just did a big social media event yesterday where we announced uh, detection of evidence, not proof, but evidence for uh, detecting a what we call an exomoon, which would be a moon outside of our solar system. So, you know, we're finding planets outside of our solar system, but now to see a moon around one of those, or to detect evidence for a moon around one of those planets is, is a very exciting next step. So um, so any of you standing back there, be, don't be shy, be brave. There's actually one, two, three, four, five seats scattered around here. So if you want to come in and find one during the talk, please don't hesitate to do so, okay? All right, so there is Hubble right there. It's about the size of a school bus and it is orbiting the earth that you see there below and so um, I can ask now why do you think we put telescopes like Hubble in space? Anybody especially a young person want to guess why? Yes, why do you think we do that? That is a great answer. So we do put some telescopes up high so we can look back down and see things on Earth and get a better perspective. So that's a good answer. Hubble, however, is not really looking down. It's looking out into the universe. So, so uh, any other ideas on why we might put it up so high to do that? Yeah. So it can see other parts of the world and Right. But why does it see better from being up in space than just being on the ground? Any guess? It's a good answer. It sees better, but why does it see better? How about back in the back there? Yeah. Because of the atmosphere and the way it's looking up. That is exactly right. Yes. So now, <laughs> 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 if you look up where you are back there, look up right now. What do you see? Clouds. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Unfortunately, we see clouds. Here from Hubble's vantage point, we also can see clouds, but we see them by looking down, all right? So, so um, by getting the telescope above the atmosphere, we get a much clearer view. And you know, even if there were not any clouds, it's still a better, clearer view because the 
water vapor and the other things in our atmosphere can um, basically distort the light as it comes through and, and blurs the images a little bit. So you all deal with this with your telescopes uh, here on the ground every day. So putting a telescope in space is advantageous. And this was an, an idea kind of drummed up decades ago and, and, uh, and became a reality in telescopes like Hubble. And now we have quite a few in space as well. We're also looking forward to another great big space telescope. Anybody know what this one is called or will be? Yep, James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb was a NASA administrator during the Apollo years. This telescope is still being tested and put together. It should launch in 2021, and it will be spectacular. It looks different than Hubble. It's bigger. It's got a bigger mirror, six and a half meters across. Hubble's is two and a half across and it's got all these sun shields because it needs to be kept very cold. Um, it's an infrared telescope so you want to keep it really really cold uh, um, and not uh, um, confused by heat from the earth or from the sun or anything like that so that it can very sensitively detect uh, objects in deep space. But let's get back to Hubble. All right, so here's the stats on Hubble. Hubble was launched in 1990. Um, some folks in this room were not alive yet in 1990. Uh, it was launched on the space shuttle, and so Hubble is in what we call low Earth orbit. It's not that high off the ground, right? It's about 350 miles more or less off the surface of the Earth, so it's not really put into space to get it closer to anything. It's just put up there to get it above the atmosphere. And also, in low Earth orbit, it was uh, able to be launched by the space shuttle, which also flew in low Earth orbit, and to be serviced repeatedly by space shuttle missions. So it was accessible. That's the good reason to put a telescope in low Earth orbit. However, there's also a downside to putting a telescope in low Earth orbit. and um, Anybody have a guess what that might be? Sorry? Yeah, there's a little drag, so every once in a while we've had to reboost it a little bit. But the hint is this huge thing right here in the bottom half of the picture. <laughs> so it turns out that Earth is in the way of what we want to look at half the time, all right? So. So, um, you know, that's the downside. Now, for the, the Webb telescope, it's going to be much farther out. I'll show you its, its uh, position later on. So then it won't have this problem of the Earth being in the way, but it's also not going to be serviceable by anything. So this is the, the downside, is that the Earth's in the way a lot of the time. But we, we use that time when Hubble is, his view is blocked by the Earth to do things uh, uh, that are important for the data, downloading the data, taking care of calibrations and things, so it's n we don't waste the time. It's whipping around the Earth at, at uh, almost 17,000 miles an hour, all right? So it's going very fast to keep it in orbit, and, uh, and because of that, it has to have very good gyroscopes to keep it stably pointed at whatever we're looking at, right? So it's almost uh, miraculous to me that we can get such marvelous images with the stability of pointing while it's whipping around at 17,000 miles an hour around the Earth. So here's an example of a marvelous image from Hubble. This is the, the core of the Omega Centauri Globular Cluster. Any of you looked at Omega Sen with your own telescope here? Or, yeah, yeah, okay, so, so you're familiar with it. Um, Hubble, because it's above the atmosphere, gets very sharp resolution. So we can, we can differentiate star from star in the middle of this very dense cluster. This was actually a calibration image taken from the newest camera that was installed by astronauts on Hubble a few years ago, the Wide Field Camera 3, which was put together at Goddard Space Flight Center, where I work. And we're very proud of this camera. It sees all the visible colors of light, but it also sees a bit of infrared light and a bit into the ultraviolet. So you get a, a broad span of, of color coverage. And that's all encompassed in this image here of stars. So you can see clearly that stars are not all the same, right? Um, they're, they're beautiful. You see, uh, to me, this is like a collection of gemstones. Um, we see reds and blues and whites and greens and, and um, different colors 
uh, indicating that stars are not all the same. They're different masses. In general, stars can be very different ages. In this case, they're all fairly old stars. They're part of the same, same globular cluster. Um, but they are different sizes and different outer temperatures, and that's what creates the different colors that we see here is, is different atmospheric temperatures. Um, and uh, we see reds and blues and whites and greens. Which ones do you think are the hottest ones? Good guess, but actually blues are the hottest ones. Yeah, so um, they're all hot, though. They're all stars, right? So. All right, so stars form in these magnificent interstellar clouds. Um, so this is the image we released for Hubble's 25th birthday a few years ago. The um, cluster is called Westerland II. And you can see this cluster of very hot, bright stars, massive stars, bigger than our sun here, having recently formed out of uh, interstellar gas. Here's some of that leftover gas. And if you know what you're looking for in infrared light, you see that this is actually seeded with a lot of smaller, lower mass stars that are still forming. So the lower mass stars take longer to coalesce from the gravitational collapse of of, uh, of gas than, than massive stars. So massive stars often form real quickly and then they have a lot of winds and, and, and outflows that blow away the surrounding gas. So that's what's happening here. All a star is is basically a, a, a clump of gas. So our, our galaxy is filled with gas and gas nebulae. Some of them are denser than others. And if you get little pockets in these clouds that are, I mean, they're pretty turbulent. The gas is moving around. But if you get little pockets that are dense enough, then the gravitational pull of that gas on itself will be stronger than the turbulence, and it'll just collapse due to gravitational pull. And if you have enough gravitational pull and enough stuff, enough, enough gas, mostly hydrogen in these little clumps of gas, then you'll get pressure very high in the core of that collapsed ball of gas and the pressure can incite a reaction called fusion and fusion causes hydrogen atoms to uh, uh, um, bind together and a series of reactions that e eventually end up with helium atoms and light being really photons of light so that's what a star is is basically a collapsed ball of gas held together by gravity causing fusion in the core and releasing light. That, those winds and the radiation coming from the big stars blowing around away the leftover gas can create these little pillar-like structures you might see in here. So we often see in these interstellar clouds big pillar. These are just dense clumps of gas that are being hit by winds from the massive stars. And the densest clumps kind of hang on the longest and the wakes behind them. So they always point back toward a bright star. So you see these little columns here. They're all pointing more or less toward the bright cluster here because the winds are coming off the star. Yep, I've got a question. Isn't that effect, uh, actually just shadowing? Yeah, it is, sh it, well, it is shadowing in the sense that it sh it, it's shadowing the wind from the winds and, the, and the, um, the, the stellar winds that can't, get past the little clumps at the tips of these things. Now, the tips of these things, being the densest little little globs in the cloud, are also the primary spots where you would expect subsequent low-mass stars to form because they're the densest. So if you look carefully at some of these column-like structures in other clouds, you can see in infrared light that, they, that proto stars are starting to form in there. So the lesson here is that these interstellar clouds and, and star regions are beautiful and they're also active. They're actively doing things. When astronomers see a colorful nebula, we say, oh, it's beautiful. But we also say, oh, that means star formation is still active. In fact, the colors here are showing up because some of these stars are massive enough that they're, the radiation is very powerful and will ionize the gas. And when gas gets ionized, it means the electrons get separated from protons. And then when, when these atoms recover, they will release light in the colors that we can see. So uh, active star formation and beautiful. Um, it's probably, I'd, ha I'd actually have to look that up. I don't know that for clear, but uh, um, let me see if I can get this going here. There we go. I forgot. I forgot we have a little uh, a, um, fly through here. So, so we can actually 
make some educated estimates of the distances of different things in these images and then by computer create a kind of 3D um, uh, simulation of what it would be like if you flew through. So here we are going through Westerlin 2. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> You're asking all the right questions, so I just... Uh, so, but you see the little pillar-like things, right? They're all being carved out by these kind of winds, invisible winds uh, 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 coming off of these massive stars that formed more quickly. So big, massive cluster of stars that formed quickly, lower mass stars still starting to form. All right, very nice work. All right, so... Um, as I mentioned, we the world has been celebrating Hubble for quite a long time, especially on its 25th birthday uh, three years ago, and we had the administrator of NASA. We had a news conference at the Newseum in Washington. This is John Grunsfeld, who's one of the astronauts who's been actually touched Hubble several times to service it. Um, Westerlin 2, you see, is in the background here, and, and we even ate a Hubble cake here, so there you go. We're very grateful to a lot of people on the ground who keep Hubble operating and the astronauts who've gone to visit Hubble several times. So this is the crew of astronauts that went up to Hubble the last time on the space shuttle back in 2009. And I say the last time because the space shuttle isn't operating anymore right now as NASA is preparing future space vehicles that will be more powerful than the space shuttle, but we're in that intermediate time right now. And um, so we were really intensely interested in this servicing mission being successful because we knew it might be the last time we could go to Hubble. And it was wonderfully successful. So this is a, a mixture of folks. Some of them are scientists. Some of them are engineers. Some of them are pilots. And they all did a great job. But we'd been preparing for years uh, for them to either install new science instruments or repair some of the ones that were already up there. Um, and so here's a couple of them uh, on one of the days of their mission that the space shuttle went up. It docked with Hubble so that they all orbited together around the Earth. And then the astronauts, every day a pair of them would come out on a robotic arm here, go out to the, the, the telescope which had been brought into the cargo bay of the space shuttle, and they would do things. They put in two new science instruments. Um, they repaired two other science instruments. They put in new gyroscopes and batteries. So they, they left the telescope um, in really good shape. But it was, it's quite dramatic, um, these missions. Uh, there were some tense moments when we didn't think everything was going to come out the way we hoped. But, but it did. And so that's, wh that's what a camera looks like for Hubble. It looks like a piece of pie, basically. They're modular. You can pull them out and and put new ones in, um, so that's a, a nice one. But it takes all these people on the ground here to make these things go. In fact, just last night I was at a meeting in this control room right here as we were talking about Hubble's gyroscope health and things like that. So lots and lots of people on the ground to make a space mission work. Um, engineers, technicians, uh, certainly politicians, and uh, uh, educators, communicators, and taxpayers. So thank you very much. Yes. Tool making is a very important part of our work here. So these are engineers at Goddard Space Flight Center and they had to develop specialized tools for the astronauts to do the very specific servicing tasks on the telescope. So for example we had to repair one instrument that required removing a bunch of little screws that were holding the cover on. It was not designed to be repaired in space. So the engineers, clever enough, found a way to kind of put a cover plate over that instrument that would hold the screws in with little holes in it and then basically developed a specialized power screwdriver that would work with these big pressurized gloves that the astronauts have to wear. And so they could do this very tedious job of removing 111 little screws but not losing them in the telescope and do the repairs and put on a simpler cover. So, uh, you know, our heroes include uh, engineers as well. We've had several missions over the years for Hubble. It was launched in 1990, so these are just showing you the various missions, 1993, 97, 99, 2002, 2009, and the different kinds of instruments that were re replaced or repaired or installed during these various missions over the years. Some of you may remember when Hubble was launched, it had some problems. Anybody remember that? Okay, so um, <laughs> it needed glasses. So. 
Uh, Hubble was a terrible uh, uh, disappointment and embarrassment to the agency when it first launched because it turns out it, its images were just not that impressive and it turns out the mirror had been perfectly beautifully ground to the wrong specs, okay? And so that was, uh, that was really a tense time. But um, fortunately, everyone put their heads together, and by the time of the first servicing mission, a solution had been found, which was basically putting corrective optics up on the telescope glasses. And uh, ever since then, the telescope has been working beautifully. All right. So, uh, and in fact, we don't even have those corrective optics on the telescope anymore, and that's because we actually put in the instruments, in the newer instruments, we put a correction in the instrument itself now. Uh, when we, when it gets put on Hubble, so it's kind of like having done laser surgery, you know, correction for the for the telescope. All right, so the astronauts returned safely on the space shuttle back in uh, nine, 19, I mean, two thousand nine, and since then the telescope has been working and is working very well, and we're enjoying images like this. Here's an old star that's uh, uh, losing its outer atmosphere in a quite spectacular bipolar fashion. Um, this nebula, we call anything fuzzy a nebula, all right, so, so this nebula has a, has a name. What do you think it is? Yep, good, all good guesses. Some people say it's, it looks like a bow tie. Some people say it looks like an hourglass, um, uh, and that's all good. It's actually called the Butterfly Nebula. Oh, sorry. Okay, good, good. Um, well, here's another one. Maybe you can guess what this one's called. Have a guess for what that one's called? All right, yes. Uh, Zeus? A Zeus. <laughs> well, in my view, there's no right or wrong answer, right? I mean, a cloud can look like what you think it looks like, right? So to me, this looks like a dragon. But, but uh, most, uh, most people know it as the Horsehead Nebula. How many of you have looked at the Horsehead with your own telescope or the backyard? Yes, so everybody has. But you probably haven't seen it quite like this. This is an infrared, um, using an infrared channel on Hubble, so you see a lot of the kind of more ethereal dust emission around. And then here's back to our uh, Omega Sin cluster. Now, I want to uh, show you the wider field of view. So Hubble is a very good telescope, but it doesn't do everything. And in fact, Hubble sees only a small field of view in the sky. Um, and so it's helpful to kind of back out and get the wider field here. So this is a, a telescope on the ground. Um, don't ask me which one, but it's a telescope on the ground that has taken a wider field image toward the galactic center here. So this is looking toward the galactic center. You see a lot of dust, a lot of stars, and as it turns out, a lot of clusters. And we're going to zoom in now to one of these objects and then transition over to the Hubble image. I think I have to do this manually here. Um, I hear a train. Okay. Is that going to work? Come on. Yeah, all right, so here's Centaurus. We're zooming in to one of these objects, which we now can tell is actually a cluster of stars. And then as we transition over to the high-resolution capabilities of Hubble, we see the inside of that cluster, all right? So that kind of gives you the perspective, right? You kind of need um, different telescopes, different fields of view to get that perspective. And in fact, that's one thing that I... Um, I like about astronomy, I think of it as like a symphony orchestra where uh, the different telescopes have different capabilities, but all together they give you a, a bigger, beautiful picture of what's going on. So we need telescopes that have different wavelength coverages, different fields of view um, to give us these different perspectives. Um, Can I ask a sure. So something we, you know, when we're out observing at night, yeah. so Yep. But that shows a lot of blue stars in it that might suggest, are those younger stars? Well, you can actually have blue stars, um, um, well, I mean, these are, so, so, so you can have blue stars that are blue because they are old. They're still, they're still old, even though they are blue. Normally, if yeah. they're blue, typically they're, they're younger stars. That's not the case. No, they're, they're no stars. you can actually have stars that have evolved off of the main sequence and they become blue so 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 these are all older stars there aren't any young stars in this globular cluster yeah 
But you can do more with this, which I don't have in this presentation, but you can then actually, t because you can resolve star from star in here, you can actually do, do a spectrum of each individual star, and you can actually find out that a cluster like this actually has more than one population of star. If you do something called the, the uh, color magnitude diagram, some of you who've, who, who are familiar with this in astronomy, it's, it's a way of, of classifying the age and the size and mass and temperature of a star. And it looks like there's actually two interspersed populations in, in this cluster. They're, they're still all old stars, but but it, this must have an interesting history. It may be a merger of two clusters. It may have had two episodes of star formation. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. A piece of paper three football fields away. I like that. Okay, very good. So here's the, the, what I call the symphony of types of telescopes we're using. We use telescopes on the ground. So this is an example. These are the Keck telescopes on top of a, we hope, dormant volcano in Hawaii. <laughs> um, we use uh, telescopes in space, certainly Hubble, but other telescopes as well. And we use radio telescopes, um, getting a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They all tell us different things. I'm actually, don't tell NASA, but I'm actually a radio astronomer. Um, and radio telescopes are typically run by the National Science Foundation and other facilities. In fact, I work down in Charlottesville here at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory headquarters for many years. And if you go out to West Virginia, you can see the Green Bank Observatory, which is a radio telescope very much worth visiting. These things are great at looking, for example, into some of those dense clouds that interstellar clouds where stars are still forming. Hubble can't see in very far in, into those things. So we use different kinds of telescopes. Here's a, di a different way of looking at it. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum, all right? So it represents the different kinds of light uh, that are out there, different kinds of radiation. So our visible light that we're used to, red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet, is that it? Um, right there is, is right in the middle, but that's just a small piece of, the con of, of how much information is coming to us from space. A lot of things radiate in lower energy infrared, microwave, or radio waves, and a lot of things radiate in higher energy too, like ultraviolet, even x-rays and gamma rays. So we need different types of telescopes to pick up this different type of radiation. So there's some uh, pictorial examples here. A lot of them have to be in space if you want to see ultraviolet light, for example. Some of them work just fine on the ground, like radio telescopes. And uh, here's some names. So here's some, just some examples of different types of telescopes, like Hubble, that sees mostly visible light here. Um, but we have uh, ch the Chandra X-ray Observatory in space, the Very Large Array Radio Observatory that I did all my uh, doctoral research with on the ground. So you see the, the kinds of tools that we use. Right? And then, as I mentioned, James Webb coming up will be an infrared telescope. I, I, I won't go into all the specs, but it's going to have a lot of different instruments. It'll do great science, including seeing very distant galaxies that are red-shifted by the expansion of the universe, even farther away than Hubble can see. And it will also see into these dense regions where stars and planets form. There it is at Goddard Space Flight Center being put together. So this is a real photograph in a big clean room. You see everybody's in their little white bunny suits there um, to keep clean. Um, but this is a beautiful mirror. It's a beryllium mirror, which is a lightweight mirror, gold-covered, um, should do spectacular work in the infrared. And uh, when it unfolds, this, this is the prime focus here that will actually come out in front of the thing, and the science instruments are behind. It was going to be quite spectacular. It can be visible light that is red-shifted, or it can be infrared light that's nearer by. So it will actually look into some of these interstellar clouds and things closer up that just... Yep. 
or even or even more so even ultraviolet what was originally ultraviolet light in vigorous regions of star formation but they're just so far away and they're being and the light is being stretched to these longer wavelengths as it travels through expanding space that the telescope receives it as infrared light yeah so that's just a comparison the hubble's mirror size is two and a half meters the james webb is bigger um, this, these are these, some of these wavelengths of light just going from the, the visible rainbow into the infrared. And you see Hubble sees the visible light, and actually Hubble sees some over here, the, the ultraviolet, but into, a little bit into this infrared part of the spectrum. But the James Webb Telescope will see not much visible light, but a lot of infrared light. So what we're hoping is that both of these observatories will be operating at the same time for a few years. If, if Hubble will just hang on for a while, and if James Webb will get itself launched, then we'll have both of them for a few years. And, and we can do a lot if we have all of these colors uh, covered with these magnificent observatories. And in fact, this is, this is not to scale here, all right, but I just want to explain how Hubble is orbiting the Earth at low Earth orbit, and the web will be much farther than the moon, right? So it's going to be way, way away at a place called L2, a Lagrange point in space, um, which basically will be orbiting the sun along with the Earth. Um, but the idea is to get it away from heat sources and, and keep it very cold. Um, I don't know. This is not to scale, but it will be small enough to be not a problem. They're more concerned about the sun, so that's why these big heat shields are basically always going to be pointed toward the sun. Yep. All right. I want to uh, spend a few minutes <laughs> telling you about the entire universe. All right. So, um, <laughs> so, so <laughs> I'm going to try to finish here in 10 or 15 minutes, and, and uh, okay. <laughs> Is it still cloudy out there? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> well, you know, I just figured in this crowd, if if the uh, clouds clear, everybody will jump up and run out. But uh, as long as it's cloud. Okay. All right. Very good. So I can't cover all these things, but Hubble does all this kind of science. It looks at galaxies. It looks at the universe as a whole. It looks at gas between stars and galaxies. It looks at our solar system. It looks at stars. Um, so I'm going to just give an example or two from each of these categories, all right? Um, so let's tar start with um, our solar system. I think this is a beautiful image of Jupiter. And what Hubble can do, having been operating for 28 years, is to go back and look at these outer planets every year, periodically, and just see if they're changing. And in fact, their atmospheres are changing. Like Jupiter, uh, you can see these gorgeous bands of this gas giant planet, but, but uh, one of its most famous features is this, this great red spot. And it turns out the great red spot, as you look at these images over years, you can tell that it's changing. It's shrinking, it's getting rounder, it's changing color a little bit. Other spots are, are coming up. These are storms, right, in the, in the atmosphere of this huge planet. And we can also use Hubble in conjunction with other observatories to, to learn things. So we actually have a probe at Jupiter right now called Juno, right? And Juno is orbiting Jupiter and measuring things like its gravitational field and magnetic field and so forth. So while Juno is right there close by, Hubble can look at the whole planet from a distance and do correlated observations, which is what we're doing in particular in ultraviolet light. So Hubble can see this really high energy light that our eyes cannot see. And that's excited on Jupiter by, by its magnetic field right up at the poles where the magnetic field kind of uh, channels charged particles from the solar wind and so forth into the poles. Same thing on Earth. We have this. It's called the northern lights, right? The northern lights show up. Well, they show up powerfully on Jupiter um, in ultraviolet. So this image is invisible light with Hubble. This is th what you see when you look at it in ultraviolet light. It's up there on the magnetic poles. And in fact, if this works correctly, you'll see it, um, what happens. It kind of dances around a little bit, all right? So you see how... The ma as the magnetic field changes and as Jupiter's turning here, um, you see the dynamics of this interaction between the magnetic field and the charged particles there on Jupiter. So those are the kinds of things we can do when you use more than one 
observatory and at the same time uh, co collaborative observation. Nope, can't, we can't see the southern. There are southern, but we're not, it's, Jupiter's not quite in the position to see that right now. I don't know if it ever is. I'll have to think about that. You might know that better than I. Does Jupiter, can you ever see the southern? Yeah. Exactly, right. We also got a good look this year at Saturn and Mars when they were in opposition. I hope you did too. Um, uh, Saturn being gorgeous with, again, a, gas, a gaseous planet with these gorgeous rings. And this was uh, one of those times when the rings were, you know, very much tilted. So you could see a lot of the ring reflection structure here. And then there's Mars with its clouds and, and other uh, features. We couldn't see a lot of features, though, compared to two years ago when Mars was at opposition before. Um, and the opposition is when Mars is, is on the other side of the Earth from the Sun, so it's relatively close to Earth, so it's big and bright. But this time it was a little fuzzier looking than two years ago because Mars has been suffering a great big uh, dust storm, right? So two years ago you could see a lot more features when Mars was at opposition. This year a lot of that was clouded out by Mars, uh, Mars dust storm. And those of you who were in the previous talk learned all about uh, Mars and its dust storms. We're even learning th interesting things about moons around planets in our solar system and beyond actually, but let me uh, say this for now. This is the a moon of Jupiter called Europa and uh, Europa is very interesting moon. It, it's uh, ice covered. You see all the cracks in the ice here. This picture was not taken with Hubble. It was taken with uh, the Voyager, I'm sorry, with Galileo probe. Um, but the background here is data from Hubble, and it's kind of uh, unclear, but you can see this kind of light blue structure down here, and it turns out this feature kind of comes and goes. These, we now believe, are plumes of water vapor that are being escaping from cracks in the ice. You know, scientists have thought for some years now that there might be a liquid ocean under this ice crust, kept melted from, from within because of some of the, the processes within the moon that keep a heat source from within. And so here it looks like there's actually a way we could study that water that's actually escaping through cracks in the ice. We might be able to send a probe that goes past and sample some of this before we ever attempt something much harder, which is drilling through the ice. Now, why would we care so much about the water? Well, wherever there's water on planet Earth, there is microbial life, right? So it's just curious to know if we went, if we looked in some other body and they found liquid water, could it possibly have microbial life that we didn't bring there? Um, so uh, it's, it's very, um, inspires the curiosity, right? All right, looking outside of our solar system, um, we have uh, the chance of seeing stars going through their cycle of, of uh, life and death. Now they're not really alive in that sense, but they do have a cycle of their existence. This is the Crab Nebula. A lot of you have seen the crab with your own telescopes here, but this is Hubble's view. You can see it um, in different colors here that are sh showing up through the different filters that Hubble uses so that um, it's representing the different kinds of elements that were forged inside that star. So I mentioned to you that stars are like fusion factories where hydrogen gas is, goes through reactions and produces helium, but actually subsequent reactions produce heavier elements as well, carbon, iron, nitrogen. These things get all expelled when the star explodes at the end of its existence and it gets mixed in with the interstellar clouds. So subsequent generations of stars have more, a higher fraction of these heavier elements. Now, not all stars explode like this. This is the debris of a star that exploded about a thousand years ago. And there was an astronomy club in China at that time that saw this happen. Um, actually, there were p observers in China and other places around the world who recorded a star brightening up about a thousand years ago, and we can still follow the debris, the remnant of this explosion we call a supernova. And we can also look at it with these different filters of light and learn different things about it. So um, here is that same crab nebula, but look, but added together is not only the Hubble image of optical light, but 
radio emission from radio telescopes, infrared emission, optical light, ultraviolet light, and X-ray light from the Chandra X-ray Observatory all combined in this image. And so you can learn things if you know what you're looking for. You can see that the X-rays are excited by uh, the energetic emission around the neutron star that's left over in the core of this, this system. Um, other types of gas emit diff in different wavelengths of light. So we use these different tools to understand the details. Now our own sun is not a big enough star to have this kind of spectacular explosion. But the big massive stars, they don't live very long and then they go through this. So you can actually see supernova explosions in our galaxy and other galaxies from time to time. And uh, they're interesting in their own right. And they're also interesting as distance indicators to other galaxies because they're so bright. Here's another example of how we can use different wavelengths of light. Um, here's a beautiful uh, pair of galaxies. I think this is the Whirlpool. And if we go, let this uh, go forward, is it going to do this? You'll see the difference between, yeah, the optical light emission. And um, as it changes over, this is what it looks like in X-ray light, okay? So the X-ray light is showing you regions of really hot emission right around the core of the galaxy where there's probably a big black hole um, and stuff falling around the black hole gets heated up. And then you also see hot emission around the spiral arms where star formation is active in some of these uh, interstellar clouds that tend to hang out in the spiral arms. So different wavelengths of light give us different information. I like this one because it shows you what a spiral galaxy kind of looks like with these hot spot clumps all around the spiral arms of star formation. All right, back to our own galaxy. You must know what this region is, right? This is Orion. And this is a picture taken from the ground, but th the person who took it must have had some kind of red, uh, red, and red capability because they really see that the Orion Nebula is showing up in a very red color here. This is the big field of view. We're going to zoom in. There's Betelgeuse and Rigel down here. We're going to zoom in with Hubble and see the detail right there of that red and nebulous region. And when we do that, we see this, right? Beautiful Orion Nebula. Again, it's one of these places where the gas is lit up because massive stars have recently formed in the core here. And the powerful light from these stars are ionizing the surrounding gas. And um, you, we see it very colorfully. Now, if we look more closely in this region, you not only see these bright stars, but you actually see some stuff embedded in there that you might not have noticed. So here's a couple of objects that we've blown up here so you can see the detail. I don't know what that is. That is an interstellar <laughs> flaw. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is a Romulan. No, OK, all right. So. You'll notice that these little stars trying to form, these baby stars are surrounded by this dark, dusty stuff. Um, there's, they're disc-like features, and they can be different orientations. So this one's kind of face on, and this one's kind of edge on. And <coughs> it turns out the diameter of these things are about the diameter of our solar system. All right. So these are disks, circumstellar disks, and it turns out that stars these days that form tend to form with these disks of dusty material. They're able to form out of this heavier material because these clouds are seeded with these heavier elements that were produced in previous generations of stars. So now the study of these circumstellar disks is a very hot topic um, in astronomy uh, because we think these are planet forming zones, right? In fact, we still have some leftover stuff from our solar system's disk, which is probably causes you problems when you're trying to observe um, the zodiacal light and so forth. Let me move on. Yeah. That picture, that was a, a mosaic of, that, that was one That's right. No, you're, 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 you're very astute, right? That's a mosaic of, of many pointings, right? 
Um, here's the famous Eagle Nebula, which is a famous Hubble observed region, but this is a, a relatively recent image of it using our newest camera. One of these regions that has the big pillars that are being carved out by massive stars that are formed above the image here. And the denser clumps here and the wakes behind them are protected for a while. And if you look, you'd be, it'd be very interesting to see into these columns, these dusty columns, but it's, it's blocked, it blocks the visible light. But Hubble's newest camera has an infrared channel, so we can actually point at the same thing in infrared light, and we see a lot more. So this is the same object on the left and the right, looked at with Hubble, invisible light on the left, infrared on the right, and the infrared allows you to peer into through some of that dust, that dusty veil, and you see a lot more stars, and you can see into these columns a little bit and you can actually see some hot spots inside them and especially at their tips where proto stars are heating up they haven't yet turned on yet so infrared gives us more information and the Webb telescope will tell us more than even just pictures we'll be able to take a spectrum out into the mid infrared wavelength so these are wavelengths of light in microns and Hubble doesn't see this far out into infrared wavelengths, but the web will, and it can see perhaps some of the compositions of some of these objects and regions in the pillars um, that we would be interested in to know if these objects could be uh, uh, precursors for, for life-bearing places, things like that. See what they're made of. Yeah, it should, it should last at least 10 years. Okay. Okay. I don't want to wear you all out here, but I did want to get outside of the galaxy. So let me move quickly through um, some of these gorgeous images. Sorry. Just ooh and awe to yourselves. All right. Oh, wait. One more thing in the galaxy. Exoplanets is a very hot topic. All right. So we, we've been discovering now, not with Hubble, but with other telescopes, that planets are common orbiting other stars, not just our sun. When I was in graduate school, we didn't know of any planets outside our solar system. Now we know of thousands of them. They're called exoplanets. They're outside the solar system. Here's a real system, but an artist's conception, because it's very hard to take an image of an exoplanet, so mostly they're detected indirectly. These are a, 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 Kep a system detected by the Kepler Space Telescope. They're detected by looking at transits, so looking at um, a star and seeing if it's starlight. Um, I keep doing this because I don't trust that the pointer will do the right thing. The, the, as the planet passes in front of its parent star, the total amount of light that we see from the star drops, dips. All right? And that's how you can tell that something's transiting, and it also can help you discern the size of that thing that must be transiting by how much starlight. So a lot of planets have been detected this way, and just yesterday we announced that Hubble and Kepler together may have detected not only a planet, but a moon of a planet this way, so it's really exciting. Hubble was the first telescope to look not only at this depth of transit, but to do a spectrum of the light coming through from the star through the outer limbs of a transiting planet and taking a spectrograph to spread out the light into its constituent colors, and then you could actually see um, what was absorbed by that planet's atmosphere, which, which particular colors in the spectrum of starlight were absorbed out, and that tells you what the, what's in the atmosphere of that exoplanet. So this technique has been used and, and is right now very vigorously to study the atmospheres of exoplanets discovered mostly by Kepler and other telescopes but then studied with Hubble as the light goes through their outer atmosphere we can get a spectrum we can tell something about how thick the atmosphere whether there's water vapor future telescopes are going to tell us even more detail about the compositions of smaller and smaller planets <coughs> we recently studied a whole system of Earth-sized planets called TRAPPIST-1. This is not to scale, and these are artists' conceptions of what these planets might look like. We can't quite take these pretty pictures. But this whole field of exoplanets is just taking off, and future telescopes um, will do it better than Hubble can. All right, I'm going to move on here. Galaxies are beautiful. I've already shown you a couple. This is a random galaxy I pulled out a few years ago from the Hubble archive, but I just think it's gorgeous. It's an example of a spiral. We think our own Milky Way looks something like this. Um, beautiful names like NGC 1309, right? <laughs> we can see them face on or edge on, and, and if they're spirals, you can 
tell they're full of dust and gas and these this is fuel for star formation so star formation in spiral galaxies is much more active than in elliptical galaxies where a lot of the gas is gone we now know that there are a lot of galaxies so this is the my favorite image from Hubble but the ultra deep field just pointing off into a direction with no nearby stars and collecting light for days and days what you see is this field of light these are not stars these are galaxies every one of them if our Milky Way were in this image it would be like one of these spirals here but we can't get outside of the Milky Way to look at it this way um, but it's quite a, an amazing thing because we not only can visually see that galaxies fill the universe but of course there's a third dimension right there's a distance and it's not trivial to measure the distance to these galaxies but astronomers work very hard to do that and once you know the distance you can build a 3d map of the universe and that's what we're flying through right now so pretend we're flying through the universe the nearer galaxies to us we're seeing them as they were nearer in time right the ones that are more distant we're not seeing them as they are in near time we're seeing them as they were when the light first started its journey to us because it's taken the speed of light uh, for for that light to get to us and so as you see in this image the farther we're looking we're seeing back in time and the galaxies in that earlier time don't look like the galaxies in our own epoch you see they're smaller they're wimpier looking um, and we're seeing fewer and fewer of them it's not because there are fewer of these galaxies but it's because Hubble can't see them they, the, the light from them is red shifted by the expansion of space into the infrared where Hubble can no longer detect the light so that's why we are looking forward to future telescopes but even now you can see in this graph which shows you over the years as the instruments on Hubble and on the ground have gotten better and better from the 90s through the 2000s and today we can get we the instruments are more sensitive we can see fainter things that translates into seeing farther out into space that's what these arrows are showing right seeing farther out into the cosmos well that translates into seeing farther back in time because it's taken time for the light to make that journey so the bottom axis here represents time from the beginning of the universe off to the right hand side up to today on the left hand side this is not a linear scale of time but we can sample what galaxies looked like in the early universe and compare them to what galaxies look like closer to us in space and time and they are in fact different the earlier universe galaxies are smaller they merge we see a lot of galaxy mergers in the early universe and they build up to the bigger bulkier sizes of like our Milky Way and also generations of these big massive stars have come and gone they've formed they've exploded they've they've built up heavier elements in these galaxies so the compositions of the earlier galaxies are simpler mostly hydrogen compared to the galaxies like our own which are also mostly hydrogen but have a lot of other stuff iron carbon things we need for dust and solids and planets to form we can lay that out pictorially and put the most distant galaxies in these circles and the nearest ones over here and you can see that they're different right so astronomy is truly a time machine of looking and seeing how the universe from the burst of energy at its beginning to today has become more and more complex and hospitable for life and it's really quite amazing to see all right more more beautiful here things we're using clusters of galaxies to clusters of galaxies are held together by mutual gravitational pull and they're just a huge amount of mass and Einstein told us that if you have a lot of mass it actually distorts space and if you have distorted space then light traveling through that space is going to get bent and magnified well we call that gravitational lensing and if you look at this cluster of galaxies which are the bright yellow things you can also see these elongated arcs of light these are background galaxies they're just normal galaxies but as the light comes through this cluster it's coming through distorted space and we're seeing these distortions that's cool in its own right but it's also telling us something about the mass in this cluster most of it is not in these visible galaxies with their bright starlight most of it is what we call dark matter that we can't see but we see its effects by how and where it distorts background light and we're also able to see some of these objects like this thing I've blown it up here this thing here it's gonna I'm gonna blow up and rotate a bit 
this is just a normal spiral galaxy in the background, but it's been stretched out, it's light being stretched and magnified by the, the lensing effect of this foreground cluster. And you can actually see more detail of the background galaxy than the foreground ones, if you don't mind the distortion. So we're using this to study very distant galaxies that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. Here's another very distant lens galaxy, something from the earliest birth of the universe, we can see what a baby proto-galaxy looks like because it's being magnified by nature's lens, gravitational lensing. So that's a very uh, hot topic in astronomy, a technique that's being used more and more. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, what's happening in this case is that the um, the galaxy is red. You see it red. It's just not shifted. It's not so red shifted that you can't see it at all. But you could probably see it better in if you had a, a telescope that could see farther into the infrared. And then there are objects that we can't see at all with Hubble, depending on how red shifted they are. All right, you're being very patient, and I've been talking just about an hour here. So let me just finish up with a few slides on what's next for Hubble, and. Uh, and inspiration, I hope. Um, so um, what we're doing with Hubble now, while we still have it, is trying, since we can't service it anymore, we're trying to use it in innovative ways as possible to make sure that we are getting all the science so we don't say someday, dang, when we had Hubble up there, why didn't we do this, that, and the other, right? So we have a lot of discussions with scientists around the world. And of course, we're developing and thinking of future telescopes that can pick up uh, w and, and improve on what Hubble has already taught us. One is measuring better and more precisely the expansion rate and history of the universe. And I won't go through all the detail here, but measuring the different distances out through the universe is not trivial. Um, if you're looking for distances to stars in our own galaxy, you can use techniques like parallax, which can help you to geometrically figure things out. If you're looking at other galaxies, you need to find something called a standard candle, something you know of in those galaxies that you know what its intrinsic brightness is. So then if you can see it and see how dim it appears, you can then estimate the distance of that galaxy. For very distant galaxies, the only thing that's bright enough that's individual that you can parse out would be one of these supernova explosions. So building this ladder and, and finding galaxies that have both variable stars, Cepheid variables are another, another one of these uh, standard candles, we call them, that we know how, how much their average brightness relates to the pulsing rate of the star. Um, and if you find a galaxy that has both Cepheid variables and perhaps a supernova, then you can cross calibrate and basically build a ladder for measuring distances out and out and out. And then you can measure the velocities of objects by looking at the red shifting of, of particular frequencies of light in the galaxy. If you know its velocity and its distance, then you can parse out how fast the universe was expanding at different epochs of time. And we now know that the universe was expanding, um, but for most of its history, that expansion was slowing down because all the gravity between the galaxies was trying to pull it back together. But then for the last few billion years, the, uh, the universe expansion has started to accelerate, and we don't really know why. We call it dark energy, but it's a, it's a mystery of physics, and we're trying to study it very carefully. Um, by the way, I didn't mention that we think our universe had an energetic beginning about 13.8 billion years ago, and we're now able to see with Hubble back to within the first 0.8 of that 13.8 billion years. So we're seeing those baby galaxies and then James Webb should be able to see even closer to the beginning of the universe. I'm going to skip through some of this. We're doing some other innovations. We're coordinating with other telescopes. Um, we're doing some neat projects that are preparing for James Webb. So we're learning more, for example, about the stars in this cluster that will help James Webb to do an even better job at studying some of the infrared properties of stars in that cluster. I'm skipping over some of this, but these are some examples of, of types of science that different astronomers around the world are doing using Hubble and other telescopes in conjunction with Hubble. <coughs> and hopefully Hubble will keep inspiring us all. So here's a couple of more inspirational. If you haven't been inspired already, these are some cultural things I picked up. Um, this is a window in a church outside of Johnson Space Center in Texas where all the stained glass windows have are based on Hubble images. Um, so the light comes through. It's very 
inspirational, colorful, and, and gives one, I think, a sense of awe and wonder. Um, we've also taken Hubble images and put tactile coatings on them so you can feel differences between a galaxy and a comet and a star and a planet. Why would we do that? Well, for people who are visually impaired, they can, they can basically uh, uh, touch the universe. That's what we call the book of these things, touch the universe. And I gave a talk to a group of visually impaired students in Washington um, and they were very, as very much excited about what they were seeing through touch as those of us who can see with eyes get excited about seeing these images. I see Hubble on <laughs> other cultural icons. Here's Hubble on a U-Haul truck. Um, here's Hubble on somebody's tattoo, all right? So uh, um, Hubble is uh, everywhere, and in fact, we were asking people around the, the country and the world, if they saw Hubble out in, in their daily life to send the picture of it to our social media spot a, called Spot Hubble. And I think that may still be active. So if you spot Hubble somewhere, send it in. These are the contributors that sent us these two photos here. Lastly, I think we've learned that Hubble has uh, taught us about Earth. You know, we're in a wonderful universe. Looking back at Earth as sunsets behind it from the space shuttle after the last servicing mission, we see the sun lighting up, backlighting our atmosphere. And you see how thin and beautiful and fragile it appears. So hopefully our studies of the universe are helping us to be better stewards of our planet here. No, this is the sun. This is the sun setting behind the earth. So therefore, the inspiration of the sun backlighting or, or uh, now you see that the, the light is, uh, looks like it's in front of the atmosphere there. So um, This is a telescope that was brought on the space shuttle by one of the astronauts that was servicing Hubble. So this is on the space shuttle. Last servicing mission, you see Hubble out the window there. This is a model of Galileo's telescope from 400 years ago. And so you see how technology from four centuries ago has been improved, um, but it took that first telescope to, to get the ball rolling, right? Um, and this is uh, um, incredible use of technology for something good, I think, right? So technology can be used for all kinds of things, but it can be used for great good. And, and the science of astronomy has inspired not only scientific understanding, but lots of other things, great art and philosophy, theology, deeper thinking about who we are as human beings. Um, now John Grunsfeld, who's the astronaut who brought this replica of Galileo's telescope up with him on the shuttle, said that he had even more admiration for Galileo because he looked through this telescope and it was a terrible telescope and he could hardly see anything. So, so uh, yeah, so, <laughs> so you all have much better telescopes. Um, so that's it. You've been very patient, um, but thank you for your attention. Yeah. Do we have time for any questions? Or okay, okay. Now, <laughs> when we do finish, yeah. And I also want to tell you that. Um, you're welcome, even while I'm talking, you're welcome to come up here. There's some images, some of the things I showed you today, there, there are printouts of some of these images and it explains them on the back. These are lithos or lithographs and you can pick up a few and take with you, all right? So, so uh, compliments of NASA, which means compliments of you because you fund NASA, so they're yours. So, um, so feel free to take, you know, I, I think there's enough for everybody to have at least a couple of these, maybe two or three, so yeah. 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 Yeah, so, so we don't point, we, we certainly don't point at the earth. Um, we can close the shutter if we need to. Yeah, yeah, right. If you're pointing something at something of, of which, in a direction in which the earth would actually come in the way, 
um, we can close the shutter if we need to if it's if we're using a, a camera or something that would get actually damaged by that um, not all the instruments would be damaged We usually don't. Um, uh, it depend. It all depends on the types of observations we're doing. But we can also use that time. Now, Hubble slews very slowly, so so it's also a good time to do slewing if that makes sense. So it all depends on what's being observed, how much integration time is needed on that particular object. Is it a fast observation or is it going to take a long time? Do we need to keep pointing in the same direction? Sometimes it's not efficient to try to point to something else and then point back. So all of that goes into the scheduling algorithm, which is quite complicated because you can't point close to the sun. You don't really want to point at the earth. Um, you want to maximize the amount of time. There is something called a continuous viewing zone that's never blocked by the Earth and never blocked by and never a trouble of the sun. So th those are, but not too much is in that particular. Dr yeah, yeah. So 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 this these are th you know unique regions of the sky where you could just get contiguous continuous observations. But most things people want to look at are not in those zones. Yeah. 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 Um, it takes so every year we have a cycle of of a deadline for proposals, and then we have a peer review. Actually, now we're doing it more than once a year, a main one every year, and then we do kind of interspersed special calls between the main call just to get as much good proposals in as we can and then um, the panels of experts meet and they they discuss and rank the, the the highest priority proposals to get the best new science out that requires Hubble then usually those are scheduled within the next year actually usually within the next six months but certainly within the next year um, some types of science take more than a year, like you want to go back and look at the same thing several times, but most of them get scheduled within about a year. And then the astronomers typically have up to a year to work with their data and try to get analyzed what they propose to study and get a professional paper written and published in the journal. The data then all go public, uh, so we have this big archive of Hubble data. And what's interesting is that the scientific community is delving into that archive just as much as they are proposing new observations and getting just as many new discoveries from that archive of data than as with new observations because this data is very good. And a lot of times the primary purpose of the observations will be accomplished, but you've still got a lot of other information in the same observed fields and filters and so forth, so you can learn a lot more on something, uh, some other topic with the same data that's already taken. So I'm pleased that our archive is very accessible and, um, and being used so much that half of the published peer-reviewed professional papers coming out of Hubble data, half of them now are based on archival use and half of them on new observations. So that means that even when Hubble ceases to function, which is hopefully many years in the future now, but, but um, we'll still be making discoveries with Hubble because of all this data we've collected in, in the archive. Yeah. What is the expected lifetime of Hubble? Yeah, um, that's a good question. We think about it every day. Um, so so uh, if th there's not a, a hard cutoff. NASA has said that we will support Hubble as long as it's being scientifically productive. So Hubble is, is a suite of instruments. We have right now five science instruments that we're using on Hubble. So we expect that, you know, that some of them are, have operated much longer than they have any right to already. So, so, you know, we may start losing some science instruments, but as long as we've got at least one, you know, Hubble's still doing good science, we'll keep it going. Right now, none of them are failing, so that's really great. We also need the, the supporting structure, like, like uh, the, the transmitters for data, we need uh, batteries um, because the, the way Hubble is powered is through solar power. These panels, these solar panels, when it is in the sunlight, it is collecting sunlight uh, to recharge its batteries. But the batteries eventually wear out, right? So, 
and it's got gyroscopes to help keep it pointed. We have some redundancy in the gyroscopes, so um, when they start to fail, it doesn't mean Hubble will immediately be uh, inoperable. But that's a very long way of saying we don't know exactly, but by trying to kind of project um, the, uh, the, the health of these things into the future, we think Hubble will be doing good science well into the 2020s, is what we say. Um, and that would overlap with James Webb for a few years. If, if Let's say if Hubble's still doing science in 2025 and James Webb is launched in 2021 and starts doing science in 2022, we'll have maybe three years at least of overlap. But it's a very uncertain thing. Well, there's been a lot of talk of this for years. And in fact, when Hubble was first launched, the idea was that you would take the space shuttle up and, and retrieve it and bring it back to the ground, even for servicing, which turned out to be totally impractical. So we serviced it in space. But there was still talk that you might bring it down and put it in a museum or something. It turns out, you know, we now know that space flight isn't perfectly safe, so it's not worth risking a human life just to bring something back to put in a museum. But you talk about reusing the instruments and things. Um, what we have done is, as astronauts have gone back and put in new science instruments, they've taken out the old science instruments that they're replacing and brought the old ones back. And we, they're not really suitable for reuse, but what, we can, what we've done with them is study how they've aged in space, and uh, we've even put them on exhibit. You can see them in the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, the WIFPIC-2 that took some of the Hubble's most famous pictures is on display in the National Air and Space Museum. The, spe the, the corrective lenses that were put on in the very beginning of Hubble's mission, we don't need them anymore because the instruments themselves correct for Hubble's mirror. So they brought the corrective lensing instrument, and it's on display at the National Air and Space Museum. So we're learning things, but we're not actually planning to go up, try to bring things back and, and reuse them or recycle them right now. So. Right, we will have to decide eventually, even long after Hubble c is not able to do science observations anymore, but we still have to figure out what to do with the actual satellite itself because, as you said, its orbit will slowly decay. Uh, the projections on that are, are uh, because, and that's highly dependent on the activity of the sun, believe it or not, because the sun, solar flare, solar activity, will raise the atmosphere of the Earth, and that creates more friction for satellites, and that makes them spiral down quicker. Well, our sun has been pretty lazy lately, so we've had a really docile sun in recent years, and that means that these orbits are not decaying as fast as they could have otherwise, which means we don't really have to worry about Hubble spiraling down to the ground until maybe the 2040s, something like that. But we have to do something because Hubble's mirror, this two and a half meter heavy thing, glass thing, will not burn up when it comes in the atmosphere. So we really don't want Hubble to land on your house. So we, so we either, what we have to do is either send up some kind of autonomous um, uh, robotic spacecraft to attach to Hubble that has some propellant to help propel it into the ocean where we want it to go or boost it up to a, what we call a parking orbit, which would be much higher and basically left there. But that's something that we are actually don't, haven't decided yet because it's pretty far off in the future. So, yeah. Question. Yeah. Really comfortable to say this is the thing I 
Okay, so that uh, marvelous question. So I don't know if you understood her question, but she's saying, oh, how do you compare? You have an image from Hubble with a newer camera, and you want to compare that data from an image with Hubble from a prior instrument that was different. Um, how do you, and even if you want to combine that data together, let's say, how do you make sure that the, the, these instruments, um, you know, they probably had different sensitivities, different perhaps different wavelength ranges, you know, well, how do you compare that? Um, that's a really good question, and it's especially important if you're trying to track something over time and see if it's changed over time, a, f a, a pulsing star or something like that. You've really got to know um, what the sensitivities are. So you compare calibration. So, th so that's why we often use the same kind of calibration technique for a prior instrument as for a, a, a later instrument to make sure that if you compare both of these instruments to the same type of calibrating technique or calibration source, um, that's one way of, of, of uh, making sure that you understand what you're looking at. There's a whole team of people at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore that look very carefully at this very question. Uh, you, if you're also studying and you want to know how something, how what its absolute brightness, you know, you have to know how it compares to some standard, and that can be true when you're taking an image, but it's even more true when you're trying to do a spectrum when you're looking at the light at every particular wavelength. It's really important that you know that the wavelengths that you're measuring are correct. Um, because you're trying to discern what elements and things you're seeing in that spectrum. You've got to know that the, that the spectroscope is properly calibrated to wavelengths, and you've got to know that when it's telling you that some particular color of light is a particular brightness, that you know exactly what that brightness is, and that you know it on an absolute scale. So once again, you have to have some sort of external comparison thing to uh, uh, either a lamp, some kind of a, um, a standard brightness, uh, frequency check. We have a National Institutes of Standards that helps out with that. Or even astronomically comparing to some other object in the sky and making sure that as you cross calibrate between different instruments from different epochs that you're able then to make, uh, to adjust things so that they mesh. But that's a really good question. And, and we... That's right. Much better said than I said it. Yes, very good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and cheer me on. I'm running a 10-mile race tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs>